Good morning. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. For 
child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace to the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The second reading is from Matthew 5, 33 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ, we have a friend like unto no other friend. No other friend can fill our heart with such a presence. No other friends can so gladden the heart, liberate the mind, and sanctify the common sense, and stretch beyond the imagination. But it is also true that no other friend is more demanding than Jesus. And no other friend can lead us to confront our true selves. As Rudig Van Beethoven once said, love demands all and has a right to all. It is often said that Christianity has been tried and found wanting. It would be more accurate to say that it has been tried and found difficult. 
It has been said that the weekly miracle of today's church, hope that that doesn't include our PCIN, but the miracle of today's church is that we Christians change the wine back into water. Instead of changing water into wine, as Jesus Christ did at the uh, wedding in Canaan. Cassie read this morning a, a, a famous Isaiah passage. And a part of their reading is that all judgment or all authority or government shall be upon his shoulder. I've never fully been clear as to what it means, but let's listen again what Jesus had to say about love and hate. You have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. What does that say to us this morning if not you have heard you have heard it said, you shall love America, the beautiful, wonderful country, and hate all her enemies. But I say to you, love your enemy, even a leader like Putin, and pray for the people of Russia as well. Sometimes we feel that it is easier to be the citizens of an enemy country rather than to be an upright American and at the same time Christian. Let's go back to the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Often that saying is misunderstood in some regard. Jesus is referring to a law which can be found in Exodus, Leviticus, and the part of Deuteronomy, a law which underscores one eye for an eye, one tooth for a tooth. The law was necessary because many times the very first method that we human devised to deal with our enemy was unlimited retaliation. Kill my cat. I will kill your dog, your mule, and yourself too. The origin of this unlimited retaliation is of course the idea that the power, the physical power, might make things right. A thoroughly unchristian, uncivilized idea, although one that still governs many actions of civilized nations today. To the early Hebrews, however, it was clearer than it is to many of us today, that the end result of unlimited retaliation is mutual self destruction. So a better way was sought, and there arose a notion of limited retaliation. In the 21st chapters of Exodus, we read that in the event a person harm another person, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, and wound for wound, and the strike for strike. Limited retaliation certainly, I think, a step forward compared to unlimited retaliation. Do unto others as they do unto Get even, but no more. Limited retaliation is what most people have in mind 
when he sincerely speaks of justice, is the uh, justification also more frequently used in our days for capital punishment. But Jesus then talks of a third, higher stage, one that comes after unlimited and limited retaliation, one which we can call limited love. Limited love. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Actually, in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, it is written, You shall not take vengeance or bear any grudge against the children of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Again, I think it's a step forward. Limited love is better than, certainly better than limited retaliation. But when the neighbor has been limited to one of our own kinds of people, then limited love has supported sometimes Nazism, fascism, white supremacy, religious bigotry, all kinds of discriminatory ideologies, the exclusive notion of patriotism, the America for Americans only, Korea for Koreans only, Russia for Russians only, China for Chinese only, which of course never meant the people of another nation. Limited love is more self-serving than generous. As Jesus recognized when he said, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collector do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? Then comes a demand of which Jesus spoke. You, therefore, must be perfect, even as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Without question, the translation presents some kind of problem. The Greek word here, the word really means is to be to be perfected, or completed, or finished. It's the same kind of phrase when Jesus used at the last part of his life here on this earth, on the cross, he says, it is finished. So perhaps we could translate this sentence like this. You, therefore, must be completely mature even as your heavenly father is mature. In other words, unlimited retaliation is very babyish in our moral scale. Limited retaliation is childish. Limited love is perhaps adolescent, adolescence, only unlimited love that applies universally to all people, all nations, is the evidence of Christian maturity as the Bible intends. It is God's desire that all God's children, all God's people, as mature adults, as God. How all this applies the present crisis in Ukraine is certainly not as clear as the sky above us, the beautiful sky, and as it is up before we come to the world, beautiful blue cloudless sky. Lord knows our judgments are always very subjective. No one has all the answers that we 
If anyone did, I think it would be simply mean that he or she did not have all the right questions to ask. Nevertheless, we must strive to think as Christians, to think with Christ's heart. And to help us to do that, let me add one more thought. You have heard it said, and then came a law. But I say unto you, and then came Christ's understanding of the will of God. Will of God. Because the will of God is, is never something less and always something more than the law. And this is important because the United States, the NATOs, and the United Nations debate what to do with the current atrocity that is committed in Ukraine by Russian military. The great temptation is not just to stay with limited love. Think only of your own kinds of fellow citizens, for example, Americans, Ukrainians, Russians, and the citizens of NATO countries. There is also the temptation to think only in terms of international law, and it's a violation. So it is natural for example, for Americans and the Western countries to, uh, to say, as so many people do, first, the war, war must stop and the Russia as a nation must be held accountable. And Putin must stand in an international trial for war crime. That is the first and the only real important thing. But let's pause. Suppose the government, the authority, is to be upon Jesus' shoulder, not our own. Suppose we go from limited to unlimited love. The first thing that we would have to do would be to put ourselves into the shoes of other people. If the will of God goes beyond the law, so do the human relations. Human relations are finally not contractual. Human relations are finally just that, to be fully human, enjoying freedom, the dignity that the Creator God has given to everyone. So the question we have to ask is not only what is legal, but what is the human, moral, compassionate, imaginative thing to do for all the good of all involved. There are a few things that I think Christians should ponder. When we are in conflict, instead of weighing which side of the story is more morally legitimate or spiritually justified and so on, there has to be something better than a victor sitting in the seat of judgment, as it has been so frequently in the history of the world. People should not, with any reason, occupy other people's land or territory just in order to accomplish whatever their political or collective interest. Tyrants must, must be, might be less ty uh, tyrannical if they knew that one day one day they might be held not only morally but legally accountable for all their misdeeds. My thought is, even though as incomplete as not as mature, but I truly hope 
that Putin will be held accountable for all the things that he has done and tried for all his misdeeds. We just cannot remain silent. But we also remember that even though Cain killed Abel, we remember that Genesis story, the very first murder committed by humankind, even though Cain killed Abel, God, who doesn't believe in limited retaliation, did not kill Cain as punishment. God leaves Cain at the bar of his story, a wonderful bar indeed, Nothing else worked in this world. I think that's where a ruler like Putin should be left. I thought at the time how wonderful it would have been. Even after, even it is a very difficult thing to do. The Israelis, after trying Adolf Eichmann, after putting the whole sad and very, very painful story for the whole wide world to see. I thought it would have been a very gracious, very, very mature thing to do and wonderful to have the Israelis turn to Eichmann and say, okay, we know what you did, the tragedy and the evil you committed. But you know, you can go. Like a king, limited retaliation when it comes to a person like Eichmann and other evil doers in our history? And could there be justice without there being vengeance? And can justice without mercy ever be just? Jesus is the one who will bear the government upon his shoulder. And I believe that Jesus is the one who will bear all your pain, all the yokes and burdens you and I carry upon his shoulder. I guess we have a lot of things to think about, a lot to pray about too. May God's wisdom guide us God's Holy Spirit lead us in our daily living of this very uncertain world in which true love, true peace, justice are very much sought after in one and another. Amen. Let us join him number 465, what a friend we have in Jesus.
joys and concerns. Let me share with you joys and concerns, finally. My mother's 91st birthday, and uh, we live happily. She says she's doing very well. She loves to be living with my sister, and we're so grateful. My sister attended your celebrate at 91. Thank you. Um, Norm? Well, I have the prayers for the family of Bella Rivera, Isabella. We call her Bella. Uh, she's had a very serious case. Cancer. She's only 18, and uh, she's in the end stages now. So, please pray for the Rivera family. Yes. We will remember her, Isabella, and family in our prayers. Any other joys and concerns? Yes, Dave. Prayers for uh, Judy and Lily. Judy's birthday. Next Sunday. Mm -hmm. And also, I would like to remind you, uh, Ruth's birthday comes in the first week of August, 99 Whoa. years young. It's amazing, amazing. Any other joys and concerns? Yes, Ken. I still need to take my daughter. Um, Peggy is still at the veteran's home. She's 95 years old. know who she is and and I found this with Lyle also sometimes when he did it it got Peggy and she was acting completely because Lyle was acting in the end too and she said I was comfortable laying here and feeling sorry for you and acting in it so <laughs> and so since she's been doing that it's very hard for her mother um, but she needs to learn to call regularly up here and I said um, the joy in the house So I figured I'd stop in when I go there, and if any of us want to pop in, it's more to check on how you're doing, you know, we can't have a conversational visit, but it's nice to know that people are physically looking at your loved one. If, if somebody phones on and gets in your prayers and you bless. So if anyone will do this, so we can be a little bit in more contact with that. And if you just want to pop in, she is allowed to. season and all life, we come to you this morning with so many cares and concerns on our lives. We have planned for the summer months as time of relaxation and refreshment. Yet in this time of difficulty and crisis, some may not have the luxury of this. Yet God of grace, we need your rest to renew our 
our souls. We need to take some time to stop this frantic running around, especially this part of the world and our nation. To focus on your healing love. To let go of all those demands that weigh us down. Heal and restore, restore us, O oh Lord. Help us to be the church in times of sadness, as well as in times of war and stress. We pray for the people of Japan. This tragic assassination, O oh Lord, you visit the nation and comfort their unrested heart. Lord, we pray for the celebration of this lifelong journey, Anne's mom, celebrated 91 years of birthday. Lord, keep her in your loving heart and prevent and grant in her heart the joy and peace with your presence. We pray that Isabella, as she goes through this unimaginable challenge with her health, for Lord God, stretch out your healing hand and embrace her. Provide consolation and peace even in the midst of these stormy situations. We pray for Judy and Lydia. Comfort their souls, O oh Lord. May our visit and sharing of loving word for them to be the reflection of your presence and your love. We pray also for Peggy, whose memory is slowly lapsed and erased. Lord, but we command your spirit to feel in her heart all the loving and wonderful memories that she carried for all these years. Although many of us have recently learned more frequent about this gun violence in our nations. We know that people have been mourning the loss for quite some time. Comfort those who grieve his loss by bringing justice so that the murders like this never happens again. We pray. As we have brought our cares to you in our prayers, let us bring our lives to your healing mercy. Strengthen and heal us. Get us gently ready for all the opportunities that stretch before us. For we ask these things in the loving name of Jesus, who also taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we gather our thankful hearts, let us bring what God has
God, you crown us with distinction and honor. You lavish us with the gifts in abundance. You spread your mercy before us as a host preparing a banquet. What we offer, we have already given to us. What we do with our hands is a gift of the life you breathe into us. We give you but your own, a legacy of your love and concern. In Christ, Amen. Let us join our final hymn, 826. Lift high the cross. We will sing verses 1 and 3 and 4. strength of God sustain us, the power of God preserve us. May the hands of God protect us, may the way of God direct us. May the love of God go with us this day and forevermore. Amen.